Um, I grew up in a musical family because my, my mother was a, a pianist. She, she had to stop because she had a disease with her he ears when, when I was born, actually. So I continued, I think, the music. Uh, yeah, she continued the music through me always. It was like a, a beautiful um, exchange. And, but she was playing the piano when I was uh, in her uh, belly. <laughs> And, uh, and my sister was playing the violin and I was always uh, playing around and dancing. And, and I asked when I was four like, to play also an instrument. And I wanted to play the violin like my sister. But uh, my mother said, maybe it's better if you choose something else and we can all play together. So we, we listened to some CDs. And that's the first memory of my life. Actually, I, I remember this sound of the cello. And I said, this is what I want to do. And it was, now I, I heard that it was the suite from Pablo Casals. But uh, I just, it's a very vague memory, but I remember this impact of the sound on me. And it was, it became immediately in a part of myself. And since that day, I'm a cellist. I never thought what, what do I want to do as a job or it's like, a, it's a part of me and it's, it's very natural. I, I have to play and I have to give the music to the audience and that's my purpose here. <laughs> we always say it's a difficult uh, job, of course, because it's a lot of pressure. You have to, to go on stage, you have to be perfect. Perfection doesn't exist, but you have, you cannot really fail, it's not an option. <laughs> Uh, so you, you have to practice so much, you have to give your entire life for this, you have to sacrifice social life a lot, which was never a problem for me because I, I, I love practicing and I, I love being in my own world and I love traveling, also alone. I mean, for me, it's not a burden, but, but the difficulty is more than at the, end, at the end of the day when you play and then you come alone to your dressing room and, and you want it to, to be better, you want it to, you, you always want to, to achieve more. And, and, and the, for me, the real difficulty is there uh, with yourself to accept that sometimes you, you're, you're not good enough for what you would like to be. <laughs> How, yeah. and, um, and to always uh, try again, to always have the courage to, to go again and to, to improve. And that's, that's why also I find very nice that um, Fazil Say wrote a cello concerto for me called Never Give Up. And for me, Never Give Up is um, it's my motto in life, I think. Sometimes uh, it's, yeah, you, you can achieve so much more when you have failed the first time. <laughs> so, yeah, I think for all musicians, but all, everybody, never give up. It's most important advice. <laughs> I was very lucky to study uh, in Germany 10 years when I was uh, 18. First I studied in Paris and then when I was 18 I went uh, to Berlin and, uh, and then to Cologne and then to Weimar and then back to Berlin. I studied with, uh, with Franz Helmerson, with Wolfgang Emanuel Schmidt and uh, I went to a lot of master courses, uh, for example with Stephen Iserlis and um, and they gave me so much, uh, my, my cello daddy. I mean, in very different ways. Uh, Franz Helmerson was like um, this uh, old, wise cellist. He was not so old, but you know, he had this very calm and uh, you, you could trust him, you know, he was, but uh, he was never saying things straight. He was always making you understanding by yourself. So sometimes it was very difficult to get because he went in, in circle around the point until the time when you 
get to the point yourself. But that was the best school because at the end you have to become your own teacher. You have to be able to, when you practice, to hear yourself. And it's, just, it's so difficult to really hear what you do because you're so involved also with all your feeling, also the idea that you want to hear and to hear exactly what you know and not the idea. Difficult. And then um, with Wolfgang Emanuel Schmidt, he's a bit younger and he gave me a lot of tips uh, on stage. You know, he was still, he's still playing a lot and he helped me to, to, to start uh, my, my career on stage. That was so important. And Stephen Isserlis, he's, um, he's a poet. <laughs> he was always a huge inspiration. He's a kind of person you cannot imitate. I remember my first uh, lesson with him. I was completely lost because he's playing so differently and I was trying to do the same. It was terrible. <laughs> so after I just understood that he, he just this kind of, of freedom and, um, yeah, and poetry. Uh, that he has and and love of course for the music and respect and so he's, he's also a big figure in my development and today I'm very happy to play on the Stradivarius for your month Stradivarius that he was playing for eight years so that's that's also very nice for talking about it and he helped me to to get the cello so he's also one of my cello daddy uh, I'm giving master classes sometimes uh, in the summer when I when I go um, on festival, for example, in Kapuschfest or in the States. So every time I go, I give master classes, and I, I want to do it more and more because uh, it's so important for me to to meet uh, this young student from from the place where I, I play. It's so touching, and it's. They are, they are so amazing, it's such a big inspiration to see a little kid, 11 years, who, who plays Haydn Concerto with full passion. And so this is something I want to do more and more, and also to go to, to schools to meet uh, the children and to, to help them discover the magic of the music, because I think they just need to know that the music is speaking to everybody and that it's, uh, it's not old fashioned, that it's a language uh, of, of today. I mean, if we play composers that compose things from 200 years ago, it's just because they are masterpieces. It's like we still read Dostoevsky, we still uh, read um, uh, Notre Dame de Paris, yeah, Victor Hugo, we, we, all these things stayed because it speak about love, it speak, speak about life and it makes you a better person and that's the same with Beethoven, Mozart, Bach. That's why we still play it and that's what I want to explain to the kids, that it's a, it's a, it's a music of today, classical music. I love Budapest. It's a, uh, it's very special. This, uh, this mix between very old and all the tradition and a big empire, and it's so proud. You know, you, you feel like you, you're part of this big European um, cultural legacy, and it's so inspiring. But you can feel this vibe, this very young vibe also, and it's very much alive, and. Uh, I don't know, I find it a uh, very inspiring inspiration that can be uh, walking on the street and seeing the people. I Actually, I, when I, I travel, I love to walk in the street the night before the concert and to feel the city also because you can feel a little bit the, the audience already. You can see what kind of people are here and I, 
I really need to feel this exchange, and then it, it this is for me the biggest inspiration is uh, is the public. I play completely differently when because it has a meaning. Suddenly, you just give. Uh, you don't, yeah. You, you play for someone, and it, and then I play is also so much better. Um, but inspiration is also in other musicians. I was always uh, fascinated, for example, uh, by Janine Janssen. I love this uh, violinist because she's she's so um, uh, one hundred percent is not enough. I would say one thousand percent in the in the music, and she gives everything. She has this fire burning, like Jacqueline Dupré, for example. All the sound of Rostropovich was also always my my biggest inspiration because it's so full of of soul and of heart of so and and then the next biggest inspiration is uh, literature i uh, because when i play music it's it's a note so it's all the emotions of the world but without uh world so it's nice for me to to read these stories because when i when i play i I often think that I also tell a story to to the audience. You know, you always always tell something uh, about humanity, and and so I, I I love to read, and I sometimes I, I think about situation in books when I play. This very very strong feelings that you can feel when you read. You can also express them in the music. I I played Kodai um, many years ago, and. I, I loved it. I love the. Um, I I feel, I feel a bit stupid to speak about Hungarian music to <laughs> Hungarian people, <laughs> but uh, for me there is something so proud in this music, um, full of um, energy and full of yeah, n it's nobility and and at the same time it's full of feeling, but it's never like like Russian music where you express and you almost die, you know. Hungarian music, I think you, if you die, you die very proudly. <laughs> it is something I love. <laughs> and uh, when you are a young soloist, you cannot always choose what you play. For example, they, they build a season with, uh, with the big, big stars. Uh, and the big stars are doing like Paris, Budapest, London with Brahms concerto. And then, uh, so, and then at the end, they, they have still space and they then they want Elga, and for example, and then ask you, can you play Elga? And you say yes, because you love Elga. <laughs> so this season I play Elga many times, which is great, but also many other concertos. And it's it's a little bit of difficulty, but I think it's every young soloist has this. I remember Fazil Sai, he told me a few years ago, you just have to practice like hell, because they will ask you to play so many different things, of course, and you have to say yes, you have to go to New York, you have to go. Uh, to Hong Kong and you have to travel and you cannot really say what you want you just have to do it uh, it's, and it's a few years like that and I think you hear you you learn a lot you also have to be careful not to say yes to too many things because at the end you have to be able to play <laughs> for the cello you have a little bit less repertoire than for violin or, or piano and also in a concert season you have like four piano concertos three violin concertos and one cello concerto. So this is less space, and that's why they were not always a bit uh, not sure. <laughs> but, uh, but I think it's changing. I think there is a big, big love for the cello in the last uh, years that is happening, um, and a big interest. And, uh, and, and people and the public loves the cello. I mean, we, do, we have less repertoire, but we have the most beautiful <laughs> concertos, I think. Very often the composers uh, arrived to the cello at the end of their life. They didn't write so much uh, before. And for example, Elgar, it's the last piece he published. Uh, Schumann, he wrote the cello concerto and then he committed suicide. <laughs> um, I mean, and then he jumped uh, into the Rhine. Uh, and Schubert, uh, this uh, quintet for two cellos, it's one of his last piece. I think it's because the cello has a uh, big depth and you have to be a very mature composer, composer to, to write for this instrument. 
because it's it's it can be like a human voice it's like a testament and and the piece that we that we have they are so so emotional so so deep and so we have less but they are extremely special <laughs> Nagyon nehéz ezt így utólag, sőt, közben is látni, hogy melyek azok a pillanatok, amik a karrieremet elindították, vagy melyek voltak azok a fordulópontok, amiknek én köszönhetem a, 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 a jelenlegi szakmai felkéréseimet, vagy meghibásaimat. De az biztos, hogy az a pont, amikor Bözanszonban azt a bizonyos karmesterversenyt nem nyertem meg, de majdnem, és nagyon közel kerültem hozzá, mert az utolsó háromba bekerültem a több százból. Az egy olyan forduló pont volt, hogy utána elkezdtem Franciaországban dolgozni. Meghívott a Dijoni zenekar egy projektre, aztán kineveztek ott zeneigazgatónak, hat évet lehúztam ott zeneigazgatóként, és emiatt elkezdtem a többi francia zenekarral is rendszeresen dolgozni, és aztán tavaly pedig, amikor lezárult ez a hat év Dijonban, akkor megkaptam Belgiumban, francia Belgiumban ezt az állást Liésben. És egyébként Kamit is innen ismerem, hogy, és ezt most egy kicsit módosítanám, hogy ő francia-belga, vagy belga-francia. Sőt, büszkén mesélte, hogy neki tulajdonképpen csak belga útlevele van, belga szülőknek a francia gyereke. És... és és azt gondolom, hogy erre az egész kultúrkörre, erre a vallon kultúrkörre, ott mindenki nagyon büszke. És, és erre inkább kezd nekem is valamennyire a, 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 a nagy globális európai identitásom részévé válni, az, hogy megtanultam franciául, hogy ö, ö, rengeteg felkérésem van Franciaországban, rengeteg művészen működöm együtt, ö, illetve a francia nyelvterületem, mert ez ugye nem csak Franciaország, hanem Belgium, és egyébként Francia-Svájc. Nagyon érdekes a francia, mint zenei nyelv, mert az 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 egy olyan nyelv, amit hogyha énekelnek, akkor tulajdonképpen mindegy, hogy hova kerül a hangsúly benne. Tehát ugye van az olasz, ami a utolsó előtti szótakban meghangsúlyozva, van a magyar, ahol mindig az első, van a német, ahol ott is abszolút fontos, hogy melyik szótagon van a hangsúly. És van a francia nyelv, ami tulajdonképpen sokkal fluidabb, sokkal éneklőbb. És ezért van az, hogy a sanzonok, a francia sanzonok azok, azok Kicsit olyanok, mint Döbüszi zenéje, hogy, 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 hogy így tulajdonképpen áradnak, folynak, és tulajdonképpen itt a színek inkább fontosak, mint az akcentusok. És, és amikor francia muzsikusokkal muzsikálok, akkor azt érzem, hogy ezek a bizonyos akcentusok, amik nekünk, magyaroknak ebben a Bartóki kultúrkörben mennyire ugye fontosak ezek a, 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 ezek a, ezek a nagyon kimunkált, kimondott, kiartikulált akcentusok. Ott ez sokkal, hogy mondjam, sokkal képlékenyebb, sokkal relatívabb. És nagyon sok esetben egyébként a Kami is egy, egy angol műben olyan helyekre tesz akcentust, ahova szerintem angolként, vagy akár magyarként nem tenne, de, de franciaként tesz. És ezt nagyon nehéz megmagyarázni, és ez lehet, hogy csak én beképzelem magamnak, de, de igenis vannak olyan, olyan pillanatok, amik valamennyire a nyelvből adódnak, mint, mint identitásból. Amik, amiket, amiket talán, talán esetleg lehet érezni, de azért nem akarom túl belemagyarázni. Nagyon érdekes egy karmester és szólista kapcsolata, hogy, hogy, hogy ez hogy alakul ki, mert nagyon sokszor szinte perceink vannak arra, hogy egymásra hangulódjunk. És uh, ugyan a, a koncert, vagy egy, az első próba előtt összeülünk és átlapozzuk a darabot, de hát 
az kicsit csak olyan, hogy tulajdonképpen így kóstolgatjuk egymást, mert annyira ott tényleg mégis ott dől el minden, amikor, amikor elkezdünk együtt játszani. És, és a Kamilla egyébként attól függetlenül, hogy többet tudtam beszélgetni vele, meg valamennyire készültünk erre a projektre, ki ki a maga módján, mégis nagyon gyorsan ment ez az egymásra hangulódás. És rengeteg olyan ötlete, ötlete volt, ami, 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 ami számomra abszolút egyértelmű volt, és emiatt nagyon könnyű volt, könnyű, könnyű volt átvenni ezeket. Különösen fontos szerintem egy szólista karmester kapcsolatában, hogy én valamennyire szinte ki tudjam találni az ő gondolatait. Tehát amikor ő játszik, akkor nekem azt már tulajdonképpen anticipálunk kell, és úgy kell a zenekarnak mutatnom, hogy majd a Kami mit fog csinálni, mit fog mondani a, a, a hangszerével. És ez néha működik, néha nem működik. A Kaminál ez, ez, ez szuperül működik. Mert úgy érzem, hogy kamara zenél. Úgy érzem, hogy nem játszik, és mi terítjük alá a vörös szőnyeget, hanem közösen muzsikálunk. This season I'm playing um, like 25 times Elga uh, and it's it's a great um, it's a great journey with the concerto because I feel that it grow every time and um, I have I have this thing that when I start playing I I, com I forgot about everything and I I'm completely into music and this never failed, you know, there was no evening where all oh, this time I was a bit bored. Because that's a problem when you play something too much, maybe you can, at, after 10 times, not feel the same emotion that you felt the first time. But, but it didn't happen. I think it's a question also of concentration before and of um, slowly during the day becoming the piece, you know, trying to, to be in a mood, to... Uh, it's a little bit like uh, in, in a, when you play, I never played, but uh, in, a, in the theater, theater, you have to become your character. And so when I arrive on stage, I, I'm, I'm the Elgar concerto, I don't know, <laughs> but I am, I'm, I'm the music. And then uh, it's just always different, different orchestras, different public, different hall, and I feel that it grows, so I'm, it's, it's good. <laughs>
you very much. Uh, it was my first time playing in Budapest, so thank you. I'm very happy that it was here with you, orchestra, and with you. <laughs> I will play now a piece by Pablo Casals called Song of the Bird. Thank you. 